So our journey through Holy Week as we follow the footsteps of Jesus has brought us to this moment this day, Good Friday, the day where we remember that Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for our soul's salvation. All four Gospels give some account of what happened on that day. Today, my heart resonates with what we read in John chapter 19. In the 25th verse of John 19, John declares that standing near the cross of Jesus were five people, his mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and his disciple, John, standing near the cross. I want to share with you that I've got problems with Good Friday. I've got problems with Good Friday for how we call it and designate it a good day. I get all the other terms for Holy Week. I get Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday when Jesus curses a barren fig tree and cleans out a decrepit temple. I understand Spy Wednesday, the day Judas agreed to spy on Jesus for the Sanhedrin Council. I understand Monday Thursday. The word Monday, if you don't know, comes from a Latin word mandatum, where we get the English derivative mandate, for it was on that Thursday Jesus gave a mandate of what we ought to do as disciples, break bread and share in the Lord's cup and wash feet as a sign of humility. I get silent Saturday, the day the disciples kept the Sabbath and said nothing. And I even understand the term Easter Sunday. Now, for those that have trouble with the term Easter, please know that in the early history of Christianity, while they debated the correct date of the resurrection of Jesus, as with most debates, they tied it into seasonal changes which were created by God. Without getting complicated, they decided that the resurrection of Christ ought to be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Don't ask. It's complicated. Google it. But during that season of the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, typically it landed in April. And in Anglo-Saxon pre-Christian time, there was a pre-Christian goddess named Estra who was celebrated. And as in most Christian customs, when the date for the Christian holiday was determined, they merged it with the pagan holiday and succumbed it. So Easter comes from the pre-Christian goddess Estra and the Christian church taking over that celebration. But what's important is there was a recognition that spring had come. New life had come, and that's why we celebrate Easter. So I get Easter. I get Monday, Thursday. I understand Spy Wednesday. I even understand Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday. But I've got a problem with Good Friday because we call it good. And I would argue to you that those who were there that day would tell you that that day was anything other than good. That was a day of betrayal, denial, abandonment, multiple miscarriages of justice, torture, execution, and even death. That was not a good day. Now, the reason we call it Good Friday is because we have the gift and the benefit of temporal displacement, which simply means we are so far removed from it in time that we can look back on it and see God at work in the midst of it in the ways that those, those who were there on that day may have missed. That's the gift of time. You can be going through a circumstance and situation. and It's not until months and weeks and sometimes even years later that you can look back on it and see how God was at work in a way that you may have missed in that moment of time. So we can call it Good Friday because we can look back on it and see how God was working out not only our soul salvation, but preparing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I wonder for those who were there on that day, if we called them out of the grave, would they testify today that even years removed, that that was a good day? 
Jesus is dying on the cross. And our Savior, who at the height of his ministry, had at least 5,000 men following him. When he's dying on the cross, there are only five people who stand in support of him. His mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and John. Our Savior, who had performed multiple miracles and fed a magnitude of people, is dying and only five people are standing near the cross. Where was everyone else? Where are all those people that were blessed in the wilderness with lunch? Where are all the people who were the recipients of the miracles he had performed? Where was the woman with the issue of blood? Where was the woman who was bent over? Where were the other disciples? Where was Peter? When I think on this day, I get mad at Peter. Peter had promised, Lord, I'd stay by your side. Peter was the most adamant and passionate disciple. Peter would become the leader of these disciples. And Peter was not there standing near the cross. Oftentimes when I think about Peter and my disgust and disappointment with him, I used to always think, well, maybe Peter was scared. That maybe he was afraid that the same Jews who killed Jesus would be coming after him, and so he wasn't there out of fear. But today I see it differently. Maybe Peter wasn't there. Maybe the other disciples weren't there. Maybe those who the recipients of miracles weren't there. Because standing near the cross is hard. Watching someone you love die is the most difficult thing you'll ever have to do. Standing near a cross is not a fun endeavor, but it's one at some point each and every life will have to go through. At some point, life is going to stand you next to a cross. You're going to have to watch someone you love die. And even with all the religious cliches people give you, even with all the assurances you know that they're in a better place, even as you get away from it in time and can look back on it and see God at work, very rarely will you think that was a good day. It's my own personal story. Some of you all know my dad was everything to me. My best friend, my father, my mentor in ministry, I wouldn't be anything were it not for Alvin John Wesley. And my dad hid his sickness from me for a long time. It was only until I was later in life and he was in his 70s that I realized my dad had battled prostate cancer for some 30 years. Remission, recurrence. Remission, Recurrence. And in his late 70s, it was clear that the cancer was winning. And I realized as I look back on those days that I was very angry with my dad. Patience was short. I was angry that he couldn't do the things he used to do. They didn't have the same spirit. And now I realize that I wasn't really angry with my dad. I just couldn't watch him die. Watching what the cancer did angered me. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted to avoid it as much as possible. I wanted him to be normal. Didn't want him on a cross. Then came that day, June 7th, 2006. Got a phone call from my mom's phone, but it wasn't her. It's Pastor William Foster from Chicago who had my mom's phone and called me. I answered and almost knew immediately. I 
Mom was crying in the background. And he said, your dad is gone. Hated not being there. And here I am, some 14 years later, and you could never convince me that was a good day. Standing near a cross is never a good day. But beloved, all of us will stand near a cross at some moment. Every morning we wake up to the COVID-19 epidemic. We see the number of people not only who are infected, but have died. As of this taping, almost a quarter of a million people have died. Death is all around us. And we stand near a cross every day. Unfortunately, and I pray it be not so, but all of us will know someone who died on the cross of COVID-19. We stand near a cross every day. I think that's why the death of Kobe Bryant shocked the world so much. It made us come face to face with the fact that you can't avoid crosses. You can't avoid death. You can't run from it. Nearly every day, somebody stands near a cross. And as I look at Mary in John 19, standing there watching her son die, I hurt with her. And I hurt because she can't grieve the way she wants to. She can't touch him. She can't hug him. She can't kiss him. She has to be distant from the one who's dying. Distancing prevents healthy grieving. Today I want you to remember in prayer on this day of sorrow and sadness, all those who are standing near crosses and can't grieve in a healthy way. They can't go to the nursing home and visit their elderly parents. They can't travel long distances to be around them. We can't even have a funeral to celebrate their life appropriately because distancing has precluded healthy grieving. And we remember them in our prayers today. I understand that in order to help flatten this curve and stop the spread of COVID-19, we have to do some things. We have to wear masks. We have to wash our hands. We have to stay at home. And we have to practice social distancing. But I want to suggest to you that what we're really practicing is physical distancing, not social. That Mary is there. She can't hug him. She can't kiss him. She can't touch him. But he can see her. And there's something about seeing her that helps. We may have to be physically distant, but we don't have to be disconnected. Won't you do me a favor during this pandemic? Call, text, FaceTime. Use every means at your disposal to connect socially with people while yet remaining physically distant because there's something about seeing a face that helps in a time like this. I don't know how Mary did it. I don't know how she was able to stand there and watch her son die. I used every means in my disposal to try to come up with an answer that maybe would help you to know what you should do. I've, I've done all the exegetical work. I looked in the Greek. I read the commentaries. And I could find no answer as to how Mary was able to do it. And it dawned on me that when you don't know how, the question is not how, the question is who. Because in the moments of life, when we don't know how we're gonna make it, when we don't know how we got through, when we don't know what the next step is, we're asking the wrong question. It's not how, it's who. And who is it that gives Mary the strength to stand near that cross? God. In my prayer, is that God would grant us the strength we need to stand near this cross in this day. 
In Jesus' name, amen.